Hey everybody, um, it's uh, Monday, July 26th, uh, really hot day here in Arkansas, um, just took a little time off my day, uh, I've been thinking about uh, making this video for some time and life just keeps getting in the way, um, forgive the paneling in the background, uh, I'm inside my house, it's a work in progress and this is uh, going to be done here in about a month or so. This whole house is paneling. It's like this. Anyway, um, uh, during my 23 plus years in federal prison, I met a lot of guys who uh, struggled with addiction while in prison. Uh, there's a lot of people that don't realize uh, just how much drugs there are in prison and how difficult it is uh, when you have addiction issues or you're an addict, either before you came in or while you came in, especially uh, when you're using after or when you're in prison um, uh, there's really no place to turn to uh, it's it's uh, it's it's a really difficult situation uh, I, I've been there um, different periods of my incarceration I've had different kind of struggles um, but today I wanted to focus on uh, two of the people that I met specifically their names were uh, um, Petro and Mobby, that'll be good enough. Uh, these guys were uh, real close friends, um, both from Ohio. Uh, both became addicts or were addicts. I I'm not sure if that was the common bond or, or how they originally met, but they both had uh, issues with opiates. Um, their opiate addiction ultimately led them to commit a crime. And I want, if I remember well, it was a, it was a just one of these uh, bundled. Uh, bank robberies where you write on a note, give me the money, and one person runs in. And there was really one. I, I call them stupid bank robberies. Um, you know, maybe uh, some tellers would disagree with me, uh, but um, they're not the kind of bank robberies where you run in with a gun and give me all the money type of stuff. So these two guys got caught for this bank robbery and um, ultimately went to federal prison together and ended up going to Terre Haute, or we called it Terre Hutt, uh, Indiana or the hut, that's what we call the prison. And um, I met them both in 2015. Um, my initial uh, encounter with Petra wasn't the best. Uh, um, I thought he was a bit arrogant, uh, loud, um, all kinds of different stuff. And Mobby was a quiet guy that uh, didn't have much to say. But um, about, Six months later or so, Mobby ended up moving into my cell uh, when we changed unit, housing units. Um, they reopened up a block called C Block that was temporarily shut down. And um, that was my parent unit. And I ended up moving back and Mobby became my cell for a few days. And we started talking and, and I really got to like Mobby a lot. Um, we talked openly about uh, uh, issues with addiction. At the time, the, the, the big drug in the prison was Suboxone. A lot of people were strung out on Suboxone. Mobby being one and was having a real difficult time. And um, um, we talked a lot about uh, um, uh, how difficult it was for people to get help while in prison. And he over and over said, you know, I, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be like this. Or this is going to be my last piece. This is going to be my last strip. Suboxone is a, it's on a, a little strip. Uh, people cut it in little pieces. So in prison, when people use it, they call them pieces. A strip is if you buy a, a quantity, you can cut it into 32 pieces, whatever. So, um, uh, but Mobby was actively using and um, uh, talked many times about how he wanted to stop and couldn't stop. Some months down the line, I ended up becoming friends with Petro, and he moved into the unit, and uh, me and him actually became really, really cool with one another. Um, still, he was a bit arrogant, still had, uh, you know, still loud and stuff, but uh, he was a really good guy. Both of these guys had um, real good family backgrounds, from, from what I know. I, I, I don't know the families, I wasn't there. The families supported them both financially, they can call on them. Um, they had a lot of family support. And from what I understand by guys that knew them, their families appeared to be somewhat well off. Um, 
I'm not saying super wealthy, but solid middle class families maybe, or a little bit more. Anyway, um, Petro and I really had long discussions, and 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 I remember him the most, just uh, really strung out, um, really really having a tough time not being able to quit uh, drugs, and and saying. You know, I remember a, a conversation we had. He's like, man, I just want to, there's times I want to check in. Check in means you, you go into protective custody. Guys do that if they, they have some kind of problems. Uh, they're afraid of violence. They're sex offenders, whatever. But he was saying because he was so strung out, he just wanted to go to the hole to dry out for a while. And, and I've had a lot of friends. And there's times when I felt that way too. It's just something you, you just can't do. It can cause a lot of problems down the road. Um, guys that have been in that are watching, that will watch this, understand what I mean. I'm trying to explain it to people that don't understand uh, in, uh, the life inside the walls or bars. So, um, right before Petro um, left prison or went to a halfway house, uh, there was a guy named Hollywood that came to Terre Haute. Hollywood was from Ohio and um, when he was on the streets, he uh, I, I'm going to say, for the lack of a better term, he was a street legend in the criminal world. So Hollywood was a friend of mine from a different spot, really, really good guy. I didn't use drugs, didn't have addiction issues. Um, and he took Petro under his wing and, uh, and, um, and really got Petro cleaned up in the months before that he went home. Petro totally stopped using um, Mobby was transferred to a different prison, a lower security, so uh, I kind of lost touch with Mobby. But Petro, I talked to right until the day he left, and he left clean. He looked really good. He was he was he was happy with where he was. And uh, I even told Hollywood, man, you did a good job with this kid because uh, you know I think he's got a chance now. So um, even though I was friends with Petro and. Uh, um, it, he's not one of the guys that I would have uh, kept in contact with, uh, meaning I would have had swapped numbers or addresses with. I've met too many guys in prison, too many guys that I've been really close with that I just don't do that uh, with. Uh, that comes from being in prison so many years, getting close to people, people saying, I'm going to write you or let's keep in contact, and they don't. So you kind of learn how to, how to just, uh, you know, uh, how to just deal with the, 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 um, people coming and going in and out of your lives, life, my life anyway. So um, through the year or last year or two, let's see, COVID's got me messed up on the timeline, but I would hear different guys from Ohio talk about Petro and he was doing really good. Uh, Mobby likewise, uh, there was a couple, I heard about him once or twice, but he appeared to be doing well. So um, last year, uh, Friday or the Friday before last, let's see. So, uh, 10 days ago, there was a friend of mine from Ohio that recently got out of prison. And, um, I'll just say his name is Josh. Josh got a hold of me and me and Josh are real tight for some years. We did a lot of time together in the same block. He was my, he was my guy. And, um, um, we were talking, you know, uh, about where our lives are now. Um, about different people that have uh, have gone back for violations for dirty urines, stuff like that. And he said, uh, did you hear about Mobby and Petro? And I'm like, what's up? And he said, um, they're both dead. They both um, accidentally overdosed a couple weeks apart. And it was, uh, they had struggles with opiates, uh, pills, heroin, and they got a hold of some fentanyl that was in going around Ohio. Ohio's pretty, pretty uh, infamous for the, the the fentanyl, from what I understand. Um, but uh, I, I'll tell you that night when Josh told me that it was like wow. But the next day when I woke up, it really hit me. And like I said, I'm not trying to claim these these guys were like my great friends. But here were two guys that went to federal prison to known opiate addicts with documentation of serious abuse on their records who entered prison as serious opiate addicts. And while they were incarcerated, 
continued using opiates or um, a synthetic opiate. And um, it, it just dawned on me like, like this, this, this doesn't make sense. Yes, they're, they're grown adults. Yes, they had choices. But I can't help but wonder if prison was better designed to help people, especially addicts with their addiction, rather than just to lock people up, rather than just to say, you can take a drug program and get a year off, rather than just to have all these bullshit classes, because that's what most of them are. Absolute bullshit. If it wasn't such bullshit, would these two guys be alive today? If there was actually a system put into place where they could have at least had the opportunities to really make changes in their lives. Uh, again, let me, let me, I, I need to be more clear about this. Um, when you go to prison, uh, there's an orientation process sometimes, and they'll say, uh, you know, if you have, if you're, there's a non-residential drug class or there's a residential drug and alcohol treatment program, and really the residential drug and alcohol treatment program, most guys can't get into it toward, until towards the end of their sentence, in most cases. And even in the, the it's called RDAP, the RDAP program, um, uh, it's not taken very seriously by staff or by the inmates. People just kind of go through the motions. And my thoughts on this is if, if there was, if, if it was structured so that when people come in and you say, yeah, I have a problem. Okay, these are the steps we're gonna take for you. This is what's gonna happen. Now, of course, guys aren't always gonna comply. There's gotta be guys that don't wanna change, but there needs to be something better in place because I know Met Petro and Mobby. I know how they struggled. I heard them. Petro nearly cried to me one day because he couldn't stop. Was thinking about going into protective custody just to stop getting high. And man, like I said, I've been there before. It, when you're in a when you're in a confined environment that's saturated with drugs and alcohol, uh, it's tough. And this isn't about trying to get tougher on the laws or bust the drug dealers in prison uh, or, or go after the staff. That's not that's not what this that's not what I'm trying to say here. It has nothing to do with the law enforcement issue. This is strictly about getting people help while they're incarcerated because there's people in there that need help really really bad. Um, when I just left, sixty percent of my unit was strung out on on. Uh, uh, um, K2, synthetic marijuana, whatever you want to say. And, and, and it's, it's, it's a bad deal. There's, there's nothing else to do, especially during this COVID time, man. But uh, yeah, so I just think that it's really sad that those two guys are dead. I, I really do. And I can't help but wonder, I don't want to place the blame on the Federal Bureau of Prisons. I, I'm not, that's not what I'm doing. I can't help but wonder if they would be alive today if there would have been something in place, a system in place to help those guys. Because those guys needed help, as do uh, more than half of the Federal Bureau of Prisons. There's going to be more dead guys that are going to get out of prison. Guys are get out of prison and are going to die soon. There's going to be more. Statistically, um, you know, uh, they say people that get out of federal prison they have a higher chance of overdosing. Uh, they're... The, their body's uh, tolerance isn't used to it. So yeah, there, there's that. Um, but there, there's got to be something better. And, and I know there's going to be people that see this and are like, you know, F them. I mean, you know, that's what happens when people get high. Uh, uh, <laughs> man, I, I, I'm just here to say, um, you know, could have been me. Um, could be so many people. And it's and it's a waste of taxpayer do dollars. Uh, what's going on right now and that is to throw people in prison uh, have a bunch of programs that are not designed for the inmates but are designed so the taxpayers will think that they're doing something for the inmates because those programs most of them not all most of them are complete and utter bullshit 
Um, so I had to get that off my chest. I think I really wasn't as clear as I would have liked to been uh, what I thought about in this video. Um, but the point is, is there needs to be some serious change so that there doesn't have to be more families who already have to see their loved ones go through addiction, go through incarceration, the penal systems, and then get out and die because they never got their issues taken care of. Um, yeah. And I do, the truth is I wrote about this issue some years ago. Wow, almost like 10 years ago. And I have some ideas. Uh, and there's also people that have done some good programs in prison. Uh, there's a guy who's a, who's, a, who's a great friend of mine and I owe him a big favor. His name is Cedric Dean. He started a program called a Save, Save, Atone, Validate, Educate. He started doing that when he was in prison. And some of the programs he put together while he was incarcerated and working through the education program were really good stuff. And Cedric's out there doing big things right now. And if anybody wants to take a look at him, they should. It's CedricDean.com or Save.com, I believe. And I'm sorry, Cedric, if I'm not right. I wasn't even thinking about you until I started this video. Um, uh, he's working with wardens, uh, with law enforcement, with the community, with kids that are in trouble in, in the community down in Charlotte, North Carolina, and doing great things. But more people like him, more people... Uh, maybe like me, once I get it down, more people like guys that are on my Facebook page that have been to prison, that are doing good. Um, or maybe if more people like us stepped up, helped something out, maybe things could change. Um, so that's all I got to say, guys.